so we're going to talk about uh, streaming here a little bit, but uh, let's define this term. What do I mean by streaming? We typically, as a uh, developer, we are used to collection. Collection is, what is collection? A group of things, right? It's actually very hard to find a definition of collection. But let's say it's a group of things. Whereas a streaming is kind of a continuous flow of data. Uh, that's why the picture is here. What? Uh, is it better now? Oh. It's going to slow me down holding this, but uh, we'll, we'll try. I, I, tend to, I tend to move a lot. OK. Uh, so streaming, it's a continuous flow of data. That's why we have this picture. By the way, I take no credit for drawing this. I suck at drawing. This is from my colleague called Conrad. He has a good slide. I just stole it, OK? Uh, so it's a, it's a stream of data. The interesting bit about this is that you cannot step in the same stream twice. So that's one, one of the interesting challenges we're going we're gonna to walk through today, right? So it's a continuous flow of data. I cannot revisit, go back again. Now, why are we talking about this? Well, what are the common use cases for stream? The first thing that comes to mind typically is video streaming, right? You have a bulk data. Well, people call it a bulk data transfer. So we have a continuous flow. Let's say there is a soccer match going on or football match going on. We are streaming that data live. On top of that, maybe we are doing some annotations on it. We are doing, doing some processing on it. Another example, common use case of this is the real-time processing. In previous uh, presentation, we saw some examples of that, right? As, as people are committing on the GitHub, was that the thing we are looking at? As people committing on the GitHub, we are doing some analytics on it, OK? So those are some very common use cases. So why reactive streams? So it turns out, like, uh, uh, almost like two years back, all these companies out there, since streaming, uh, these use cases are becoming popular, they're all building their own solutions, their own frameworks. I'm talking about Netflix and Pivotal of the world, Red Hats of the world. So this reactive stream initiative started, I don't know when exactly it started, one year back maybe? Uh, one year back. The idea is that, hey, can we all kind of get together and come up with some sort of standard here? so that we don't end up with 20 frameworks which doesn't talk to each other. So that's the goal of Reactive Stream. Come up with a specification. What is the goal here? What is the specification going to be? The specification is about we are we're going to try to build a streaming framework here, some sort of engine. But the G engine has to be asynchronous. I'm pretty sure Duncan has gone through it in length. I missed his keynote, but I'm pretty sure he mentioned this. The asynchronous is very fundamental to build a scalable and resilient application. So it has to be asynchronous. It also has to be back pressured. Back pressure is another, uh, another important characteristic of stream processing because sometimes you don't have control over how the data is coming in. We're going to spend some time analyzing what back pressure means here. Okay. And finally, essentially come up with some sort of implementation or standard so that we can have something like this. We have various frameworks here. We have Akka in here. We have Spray, Reactor, this is from Pivotal, Vortex, this is from uh, Red Hat, Rx Java. All these frameworks essentially can talk to each other. How many of you actually have read Reactive Streams uh, page here? Uh, so let's read it from beginning here for the right now. Uh, uh, it's a one-page website. It should not take more than 30 minutes. Uh, do it. I mean, it's just a really good read. It essentially talks about the problem statement and why we are doing this. Well, I do work for TypeSafe, but this is not a TypeSafe uh, specific thing. Okay, This is a community-driven initiative. As you can see, there are many companies out there. One of the things I recently saw yesterday itself that reactive streams are, Dog Louie is actually pushing to make reactive stream part of JDK 9. So that will be, a, that's a huge win in this uh, area. Please ask me questions when you have one, okay? Uh, so anyway, the idea is to interrupt with each other. All this framework should interrupt with each other. So what does the specification looks like? This is exactly what it looks like. We, we took one year literally a group of engineers, some of the smartest one, to come up with these three interfaces. That's a <laughs> one year. It took one year. Uh, so the idea here is the publisher essentially the source of the stream. Okay, This is the, the live streaming coming up. Uh, 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 for an example, GitHub pushing events. 
Subscriber could be your Spark job or somebody else actually consuming the data. And the idea of subscription is that this is the protocol that they use to communicate with each other how much data I want. OK? This is supposed to be a very low level API. OK? We call it an SPI. So what we're going to look at to this presentation is that we're going to say that we're going to build abstraction on, on top of that. The idea was that we'll come up with a very basic interface so that each framework can go and implement their own idiomatic API on top of that. Okay? So that's why it's so simple here. So again, I literally talked about this though, right? I mean, streaming versus collection is very important. This is one of the probably the fundamental thing we probably have to understand before we go further. The collection is a finite, usually it's a finite group of thing. Streams, on the other hand, is an ephemeral flow of data, right? I cannot step on the same thing twice. This is a fundamental difference. <clears throat> so what is back pressure? Anybody? What back pressure is? I pressure somebody's back when I'm having a back. Okay. <laughs> so back pressure is, let's take an example here. So I have a publisher and a subscriber. Remember, this is the source. This is the consumer. Another terminology we're going to use here is a source and sync. Uh, so for an example, let's say I have a fast publisher, okay? Because again, I don't have any control over this. And I have a slow uh, subscriber. What happens? <clears throat> well, let's see some examples. So data will be coming in in this rate, right? 100 ops per second, where I can only handle one op per second. This is called push model, right? We're continuously pushing data to me. Well, one of the way we can handle this scenario is uh, put some sort of buffer in here. Is that a good idea? Yes? Why not, right? I mean, we have memory. Let's put buffer in there. <laughs> well, the problem is that what if we ran out of space in the buffer, right? That's one of the problem. Well, uh, in that case, bad thing happens, OK? So we have a buffer overflow. There are a couple of alternatives for this, though. One alternative could be just keep dropping messages. I mean, this is a valid, one of the valid A way of implementing back pressure. We just drop messages. Sometimes this is probably the only way to do it. Okay? Then what happens is that I'm assuming when you drop messages, there is some sort of acknowledgment going on. You're, you're going to assume the publisher is going to resend the package, uh, messages to you back again. Right? This is it's not new. Kernel and TCP, lots of protocols out there do that already. It's already happening. Another alternative could be, hey, how about increase it, right? One million bytes. No. Uh, uh, well, you have memory available, so why can't we increase it? Well, the problem is that we could still get out of memory error, right? Those are all finite resources. We don't have infinite memory. Is making sense, any of this stuff? Another common approach uh, some of the protocol uses called negative acknowledgment, called NAC. What does that mean? That means is that in this scenario, we, you don't acknowledge me all the time. You are not acting all the time. You do it when you say, hey, I am reaching my limit here. Let's send a negative acknowledgment saying, I'm getting full. Please don't send me data anymore. Do you think that's going to work? Yeah, that could happen. Another interesting thing could happen is that what if while I'm sending NAC, there is an AIM messages in flight, right? This is, uh, this is happening over the network, for an example, right? Let's say I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying that I have only 10 space left. Don't send me messages. Maybe there are 100 messages in flight. So what essentially I'm trying to get here is we need to do something like this. The only logical way we can kind of address this problem is don't use streaming. No, no. <laughs> address this problem is to make sure the speed of the publisher is less than the speed of the subscriber. Right? So this guy should control it. And that's where this whole model comes in. So let's say, for an example, we are revisiting this idea again. 
If the subscriber is a fa fast and uh, publisher, we have no problem, right? This is fine for us. I'm faster than you, so you keep sending me data, I don't care, I mean, I can process them. So the idea is almost, because what happens in the real world, you will see scenarios where sometimes your subscriber is faster than the producer, sometimes it changes the other way around. It's almost dynamic. So any back pressure solution that you implement on top of this has to toggle between these two models. So idea behind reactive streams is essentially implementing this idea of back pressure which can do dynamic push and pull. What does that mean? That mean is a subscriber, we're gonna have a two-way channel here. By the way, this is all asynchronous. I'm assuming everything is asynchronous here. Two-way channel where the demand will flow upstream that give me 10 more elements I can process and data will flow downstream. Data will only flow this way. I have a, a nice little animation here. Only flow this way when I request for something. I'm gonna pause here a little bit, uh, make sure everybody on same page here. This is what it does, so that's a fundamental implementation here. <clears throat> so what happens if I have a uh, slow sub subscriber? What we, what we essentially is going to do, this is my demand channel. Hey, I can only handle three. Please send me three, not more than that. That kind of takes care of the buffer overflow error we are talking about. We don't have that anymore. If the uh, subscriber is a fast, we can, we can keep requesting, right? Okay, give me six, give me three. And the way it works is that because uh, to opti the optimize, the publisher can actually accumulate this demand. I got six, I got three. Now I got 10 elements, I can send nine directly back to the subscriber. I think we, we made the point here, right? Uh, let's, let's move on. <laughs> so if, you, uh, if we take those ideas and put it in those three interfaces that we looked at, this is how the protocol actually works. Subscriber comes online and say, hey, I want to subscribe. I'm interested in your GitHub comments, for an example. Then what the publisher does is that it sends a subscription message. Hey, here is your subscription. It's almost like real world. So it's very, uh, gives you a subscription message on your unsubscribe callback, then you use that subscription object to essentially request more objects. Hey, okay, and I can handle 10 more, can you send it to me? And what publisher does is it actually calls your on, on next by sending each element on that ad. Because computers are great doing batch processing, that's why we're batching it. And all these calls, all subscriber must dispatch asynchronously. All these boundaries are asynchronous, by the way. There's no blocking going on. That's fundamental. That's a part of the uh, TCK if you want to implement reactive streams. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice here. So that's very low level. If I give you those three interfaces to work with, that's not going to be very productive. What you're going to look at is you're going to see what what ACA did by taking these interfaces, we created a new project called ACA Streams. What ACA Streams does is that essentially says, okay, I'm gonna take this, my engine of implementation is obviously going to be actors, okay? So your message is going to essentially going to, uh, going to get an actor, your publisher is going to be an actor. Your each processing stage is going to be an actor. Why I'm gonna do that? Because that helps to build an exec, uh, asynchronous execution engine. Obviously, I can do a distribution. It's not there. Maybe we can hack together in this conference if you're interested. And I get the resiliency out of the box. Let's do some code examples here. <clears throat> I 
have a, a, play, a play application set up here, but that's not important. The reason I have it, because I want to show you some nice thing happening in the web page, that's why, okay? What we're gonna do here is that we have, we'll took, take a uh, look at this example called log messages. Let's assume we are, uh, we have this application running that's uh, spitting out log messages. This could be Kafka, I'm reading from Kafka, let's say, okay? So my idea is that I'm going to read all these log messages from some source, do some transformation on top of it, and show it in the web page. Simple enough? Okay. <coughs> First thing you do in uh, AccaStream is create some sort of source. That's my publisher. Okay, publisher becomes source in AccaStream. So let's say we'll call log source here. I will let IntelliJ figure out the type for me, okay? <laughs> so I, I will use a source. This is part of the API here. And there is an apply method in there which allows me to run operation in a, uh, in a schedule. So let's say after initial 100 milliseconds, how I'm doing time-wise is good? Okay. And then every 500 milliseconds, call this function. We cool with this? We all understand this, right? Okay, uh, I need to import a bunch of stuff here. Scala concurrent, where's that duration? Okay, all right. So uh, what it's doing is that every 500 milliseconds it's gonna do this stick. Obviously this is a function that's not interesting to me. Uh, so I am going to do my first transformation here, which is called map, okay? So what I'm gonna do is that, take this function and invoke this function here. What this is gonna give me, let's look at the type here, is a source of, I'm surprised it actually ended to nothing. Okay, source of string, so I'm, I'm reading a log line from the file, okay? And the reason it shows a cancelable, that's, that's in ArcaStream's called materialization value. What value I'm gonna end up with when my job is done. In this case, it's cancelable because I have a repeated task, I can cancel it later on. Make sense? Okay. So once I have a source, then this is where I'm going to do my pipelining, okay? This is my uh, uh, data pipeline. Once I have a source, I want to map on it, and first thing I'm gonna do is that convert that to some sort of a uh, domain object. Okay, I have, I have some methods in there. And the domain object is called log event. Based on info, debug, whatever, it's gonna create a case class for me. Simple enough? Then I'm gonna do another transformation on this. <clears throat> If you see something I'm doing stupid, please correct me, okay? <laughs> I, I know you guys want to have fun. You want to say, okay, let's stick around and see how. Yes. Yeah. Well, let, let's, uh, let's uh, take this here. Line number 55? Yeah. Yeah, I, I lift it to a function here. I'm very embarrassed. I'm, I'm very embarrassed right now. <laughs> uh, okay, so I have a, I have a string. And, and from the event, what I'm gonna do is I essentially have to do JSON so that I can spit out in the browser, okay? This is very simple enough, but I'm gonna show you uh, the, once that is done, what I have here is I have a source with some transformation. Another way to look at it is called flow. I have a flow of data. But this flow is not going anywhere. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna say, please take it to some sync, okay? So I'll say two, there is a type called sync, 
And sync has a method called actor ref. What I essentially want to do is that do all this transformation. Once the JSON is done, send that JSON to this actor as a message. So I will say actor ref out, and it takes another parameter saying the last message. When the processing is done, send the done message to it. Oh, fun of life coding. Um, this gives me, I, I'm just going to introduce this concept for our next example. I'm not going to do that. It's called runnable graph. That means I can run this pipeline now. It's just a specification. Nothing happened here. Okay? I didn't consume a single data. I just have a graph created. Now I'm going to say, okay, graph is ready. Now please run it. To run it, let's call it graph here. Let's call it G. To run it, I will say g.run. Now this says, okay, man, okay, I want to run it, but give me how should I take this graph and run it? What's the implementation? What's this implementation going to be like? It's called meteor, uh, materializer. So if I say, The default one that ACA comes with is called actor materializer. What does that mean? That means please use actor system to run this. Okay? Where each map is going to get translated to actor. Each of the stage is going to run in asynchronous. This will be done by an, one actor, this will be done by one actor, this will be done by one actor, this will be done by one actor. all actors. In theory, I could actually create a materializer. This is an interface which runs on MISOS if I want to or runs on ACA cluster. That's the general idea. <clears throat> Scala compiler is really fast. And so what's going to happen essentially is uh, this log message is going to spit out in the web page uh, where we're going to see this getting appended as the message is flowing through the system. In essentially, in play, I have a WebSocket running in. So this actor points to a WebSocket. So the message is going to the browser, and we're spitting it out. Any question? All right, let's do a next one here. That was easy. Let's do a little bit interesting. Uh, so let's say I have a ticker, okay, some sort of stock ticker, or some message I want to broadcast to multiple consumers. Very common scenario. But what I have here is that one is slow, one is fast. Let's see how back pressure actually works here. <clears throat> No, I'm not done. I, I'm, I'm trying. I can't go back. I, I have to. Re I, I think I lost my machine here. Anyone to come upstage, uh, throw some jokes while I, while I try to figure this out? Or? <laughs> and now let's see. I think I'm back. Back. I'm switching to Linux. <laughs> the next example is actually fun. I want to really want to show you guys this. 
Almost there. Anyone getting iPhone sixes? No, no, let's <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm back, back in business. Uh, so uh, what are we going to do this time? Shh. Is essentially switch a different example here. Um, ticks, ticks, ticks. OK. <clears throat> first thing first, I'm going to create a, uh, let's assume, a raw stream. Again, there's going to be a, some sort of source with int and uh, can say label. And uh, same idea here. Maybe I just copy paste from there. Same idea, but this time I'm going to do just uh, just random dot next int. You know, some tick messages I don't have any control over. Same stuff again. This I have to do because there used to be a method which used to take a by name argument. It doesn't anymore. But anyway, we have a, we have a uh, raw stream here. Uh, then uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to create a fast sync. Remember the, remember the diagram that we had there? What it's going to do is that uh, we'll have a sync dot <coughs> for each that will take some sort of uh, some sort of int message here, and <coughs> the fat arrow uh, int message here, and essentially uh, push it out to a channel. Channel is something I have in upstream, which will allow me to push data to play. OK? And it will be, I don't know why, I, I need to go to Scala class. Uh, uh, and uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to say channel.push. What I'm pushing here, I am pushing some sort of J's value. So I have to do, uh, convert that to JSON. To do that, I will convert this to an event. Then I have this uh, line number 16, implicit format, which will convert that. This is a place specific, not important, though. And uh, first message, I'm going to have something called fast and the tick. Does it check out? OK, cool. I'm going to have a similar idea here, but this time I'm going to have a slow, uh, slow sync. And uh, to simulate the slowness, what I'm going to do is that uh, you guessed it right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to put some uh, slip in there just to simulate that it's actually taking some time. So far, so good? OK, now, go ahead. Thank you. It would have been cost lots of headache. Now, what I'm going to do, I have my two things here. I have a raw source here. But this time, it's not a single straight flow of data, though. I have a fanning out capability. Now I have a broadcast that can go to multiple. When you do that, there is a something called flow graph in ACA. I'll call uh, closed 
and pass some sort of uh, function in there which takes an uh, implicit builder. I'm going to put some um, implicits in there, flow grab dot implicits. Okay. All right. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is that create a broadcast. Let's look at that. Um, This is one of the very interesting thing about streaming. Whatever you put in the whiteboard, essentially, when you're um, trying to design your streaming API, that literally kind of maps to the code. So I have a ticker. That was my raw stream. That's what I've done. Now I'm doing this broadcast uh, component. So to do broadcast, we have a, let's call it bcast in here. Then um, <clears throat> Broadcast, I'm going to have what type of data it will broadcast. It will broadcast int. How many outlets does it have? It has two outlets. We're going to two, okay? Then what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to say raw stream go to bcast, okay? That's the first ticker going to broadcast. Then bcast. I'm doing something terribly wrong here. <laughs> uh, we'll find it out. We, we have lots of Scala programmers here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to have this bcast uh, going into uh, slow sync. Let's do fast sync by passing channel. And bcast also going to slow sync. All right, what's going on? Will it terribly bad if I cheat here? No. OK. <clears throat> <laughs> As you can see, I've tried this before. A builder.add. Cool. OK. So what I have is that I have a raw stream going in, and, uh, and they, those two are getting piped to fast sync and slow sync. Let's see what's the behavior. Obviously, we haven't done here yet. So I'm going to do a graph in here and the same drill. So g.run and uh, materializer. Come on. OK. So I'm going to go back to my example here, run activator. <clears throat> Any guesses what kind of behavior we will see? Any thoughts? I have one that can consume really fast. As, as we give element, it can, it can push it to the channel. One which takes uh, three seconds to process each element. No ideas. So I have some sort of high chart um, thingy here. As you can see, it looks pretty. You know all the lines coming in? You don't see it? No? I need an internet. <laughs> I told you to connect. OK, thanks.
Sorry, it's not going very well, is it? Okay, yes. All right. So the the blue uh, the blue one is a fast lane, and the the black one is a slow lane. Look what's happening. That the slow one, as you can see, remember we said subscriber controls the flow of the data. In when you have multiple subscriber in the mix, the slowest one is controlling the entire flow. Even though I can process my fast uh, subscriber can process more element, I, the source cannot give it because there is a back pressure in play. But that's not nice though, right? Let's say this is a tick message. I don't care if I lose drop couple of them as long as I get the latest tick, right? So how can we do that? One of the, this is, this is show some of the nice power of, of uh, AccaStream's API. What I'm gonna do here is that right here where the slow thing is, I'm gonna introduce a, a dropping buffer. Okay, where I will try to keep the latest element and drop all the old unprocessed element. Sometimes it's a very interesting way to implement back pressure. So I'll say flow.builder. I probably have to go back again. Uh, not builder, buffer. Do you recognize this? Time to go to local history. <clears throat> so flow.buffer, I will say what's the buffer size. Let's put it into two here. And we'll say the overflow strategy is, is drop head. Okay, keep dropping the old element if the buffer is full. There are other mechanisms you can use here. You can say drop the entire buffer if you want to. Uh, okay. And now, now let's see how that changes this behavior. See, so first one is keep processing now while the old one is trying to catch up. That's amazing, let's watch it for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 